For eager young pro hockey hopefuls, it can be their shot at the big leagues. Playing for one of the 20 teams in the Ontario Hockey League is a dream come true. But it's also grueling. Billeting with local families, constant travel, and having just enough money to cover expenses. That's what's prompted a class action lawsuit, arguing that the players in the three Canadian major junior leagues deserve to be paid minimum wage. Joining us now to debate the issue in London, Ontario via Skype, there's Jake Jeffrey. He's a sports journalist for Global News, founding editor of the Around the OHL website, and assistant general manager of the Strathroy Rockets of the Greater Ontario Junior Hockey League. And here in our studio, Tina Yang, who is counsel at Charney Lawyers in Toronto. That's the firm representing the plaintiff players in this case. And former OHL player and plaintiff Sam Berg is with us as well. And we're delighted to welcome you two here to our studio. And Jake, good to have you on the line via Skype in London, Ontario. I don't want to assume that all of our viewers, we don't normally cover a lot of sports on this program. So I, I, I want to do a bit of a backgrounder here just to get our viewers up to speed on stuff. The OHL, FYI, a lot of acronyms here. One of three hockey leagues that are involved in this, junior hockey leagues, and we're going to take a look at some details of the OHL. So, Mr. Director, let's bring these up. It's 20 teams in the OHL, and even though it's called the Ontario Hockey League, three of the teams are actually in the United States. There are 425 players in the OHL. They range in age from 16 to 21. About 20% of the players in the NHL, the National Hockey League, came from the Ontario Hockey League. So this is clearly an important feeder system for the best hockey league in the world. And more than half, 54% of NHL players are from the minor hockey league circuits from across this country. Let's get into this. Sam, why are you suing? So when you look at the, uh, the OHL and when you look at my experience in the OHL, and I'm sure we'll talk about that more later, um, I feel there's not enough respect for the players. Really what we're doing here is trying to get res more respect for the players in any way that's possible. And right now we're starting and the bulk of our argument is that players should get paid minimum wage. When I, was, when I went through, I wasn't getting paid. I got money for gas to go to the rink and for food at, like, on the road. So How much money? Uh, maybe $50 a week or uh, the equivalent spread out so you get paid every two weeks. And uh, so you look at that and you're promised these uh, scholarship packages and they're written into contracts. It's, it's in a contract and you, uh, you take that as they're, they're binding because they're contracts. Mm -hmm. And how I came to be involved in this lawsuit is that I found out that it wasn't a binding contract that I signed or somehow the OHL decided that they didn't have to honor my contract. So I went looking for a lawyer to say, hey, like, I signed a contract to play hockey for you to not go to the NCAA, so to come play in the OHL, I want compensation for that. So I went looking for different lawyers and eventually I found Tina and uh, Ted Char uh, Tina Yang and Ted Charney. Mm -hmm. And- uh, Let me jump in for a second here because yeah. I want to do some of the background. You started playing in the OHL, how old were you? I was 16 going on 17. And what team did you play for? Uh, the Niagara Ice Dogs. And how long did you play for? I played about half a year, and in that half a year, so you get healthy scratch, you're in and out of the lineup, I played eight games. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed the hockey part. I didn't enjoy the other parts. Other parts being? So you have to deal with coaches, and you have to deal with the owners, and you have to go to all kinds of different events, and a glad hand with rich people that are sponsoring the team, and you see none of that money. Hmm. And uh, so getting back into what I said, what I was saying is that I, we want respect for the players. In my experience, the players weren't given that respect. So we went looking for lawyers and Tina and Ted said, hey, look, there's a bigger issue here. The players, you guys are not getting paid to play hockey. You guys are doing the same job that guys are getting paid millions and millions of dollars for in the NHL and you're 16 and 15, and in some cases 15 until 20, you're still growing as young adults. Mm. Uh, this is something we need to pursue. And I said, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like I'd never thought about it that way when I was going through, because you're a player, you just want to play so bad. My dad played in the NHL, I grew up, there was nothing I wanted to do besides that. 
And uh, so you don't think about these teams and the way they take advantage of you, but they really do. And that's the way they're able to take advantage of you because you want it so bad. Hmm. We should mention, Toronto Maple Leaf fans may remember, Bill Berg, who played how many years ago? Maybe 20 years ago? Yeah, so he played from about 92 to 95 yeah. for the Leafs, I think. And I was born in 96 when he'd just been traded to the uh, New York Rangers. Gotcha. Yeah. He scored a late overtime goal that was, I yeah. remember it to this day. Anyway. Good. Okay. <laughs> Tina, this case, you've had it for what, four or five years already? Uh, so I've been on the case for three years. Three years? Uh, and it was launched in 2014. It was, so it's been around for been five around. years. Why has it taken so long to get going? Uh, unfortunately, part of it is just the nature of the class actions beast. Um, there are uh, certain preliminary steps which happen in class actions that don't happen in regular lawsuits. Uh, one of those, the, the biggest of those preliminary steps being certification, which is where you have to go to the court and actually apply for the case to be permitted to move forward as a class action. Uh, and uh, we are still embroiled in the appeal of uh, certification in Ontario. We're actually waiting for the divisional court to hand down their decision from a hearing we had at the end of January. Uh, in Alberta, the appeals have been dismissed, um, and so the certification is final. And in Quebec, we're still waiting for uh, an authorization decision, which is the Quebec equivalent. So a lot of hurry up and wait at the moment. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jake, let's get you into this conversation as well. From your vantage point, what's this case about? Uh, well, it's uh, one of those things where I think an OHL experience really differs from, from player to player and from organization to organization. Um, so uh, Sam, speaking to what his, or his experience was there with Niagara, it's, it's not the only one that's having something along those lines. And sometimes it does, after, once they're gone, once the... Uh, their OHL careers are over. They're sort of wondering, you know, what's next? What happened there from looking back on their career? Speaking with some former players, I mean, there are some who are the same thought process as Sam does. Um, that The fact that, you know what, maybe they have some compensation earned from their OHL playing days. Saying that, there's also a large contingent of players, and I'm sure Sam is well aware, that are on the same wavelength. That they think, you know what, I was given the opportunity during my uh, later teen years to live out a potential dream, to give pro hockey a kick in the can and see if I can get that opportunity. So really, there is a varying opinions when it comes from uh, former players, even players in the league right now. They, you know, it's no one's dream to play in the OHL and then go and get their education after that. Guys want to play pro. Guys want to make it to the NHL or make some sort of living from it. So when that doesn't always become a reality, some players, they are looking at the opportunities they were given and say, you know, maybe I should have been compensated from that. So there is a bit, a bit of a split. And I know I have a, a few former OHLers who write for my website. And um, the ones who I have had write for my website, they're in the way, they're in the mindset where they thought they were compensated properly during their playing days. And well, let me jump in here now, for a sec, Jake. Yep. I, I want to... Um... We got this statement from the Ontario Hockey League, so I want to read that and then we'll get everybody to comment on some of the points that they make in the statement. Uh, here we go. The Ontario Hockey League's primary goals are player protection, providing competition and coaching to advance our players in hockey as far as their talent and commitment allow, teaching players leadership skills and supporting their education to ensure success in life. Our teams are proud to provide our players with the top on and off ice player experience. The hallmark of the player experience in the OHL is our scholarship program, which provides those players who have completed their time in the OHL a minimum of one-year tuition, books, and compulsory fees at a recognized university, college, trade school, or career-enhancing program for each year played in the league. We vehemently disagree with the premise of the class action lawsuit and will continue to defend our player experience as the case makes its way through the judicial system. Okay, Jake, what, um, what do you make of that statement from the OHL? Oh, well, I, they're obviously, they want to build up their education package. That's a big selling point from OHL teams when players want to choose between the NCAA route or the major junior route in Canada is, you know what, I still want to get school out of it. And that's something that, you know, Sam had mentioned there. When you're deciding between NCAA and OHL, you have to make that decision at a pretty young age. We should second, just explain that for a second, Jake, that some, some people who want to end up in the NHL, there's a bunch of different ways to get there. Yes. One way is to play in one of the junior hockey leagues in Canada. Another way is to go to the States and play uh, NCAA university or collegiate hockey. Yeah. And those are two different, equally legitimate feeder systems. And, uh, okay, sorry, just wanted to put that background in place. Yeah, Continue. absolutely. 
Well, and the thing is with that is once you play an OHL game, once you are at an OHL camp for a certain amount of time, you lose that, lose that NCAA eligibility. So a selling point for some of these young athletes when they're making that choice at a, a young age is, you know what, I still will get some sort of schooling out of it. Whether they play one year, one game, five years in the league, they're really going to get a little bit out of it. So that's definitely a big selling point uh, from the OHL. And that education package has come a long way to the point where it used to only be offered, even in the late 90s, mid-2000s, it was only offered to you know the higher end players. And that was sort of a negotiated tactic with within their contracts when they signed their standard player, player agreements. And usually those guys are the higher end guys anyway. So they didn't really want to go pursue those post-secondary educations at the uh, Canadian collegiate level. Now it's everybody. You play a game. If you sign that, sign that standard player agreement, you're going to get at least one year out of it. So that's a big well, selling point. Hang on. I got to jump in there for a second. Right. Sam, that doesn't sound like that was your experience. No, and I would actually strongly disagree with the, the, um, the characterization that all players are getting this package. Um, and actually, my experience when I went through was that my contract was signed in the summer and I played half the season until December with uh, the Niagara Ice Dogs and found out only after I had stopped playing that I didn't have a, a valid contract that the OHL had never ratified my allegedly my contract. The lawyer says allegedly. Yeah, okay. This is what uh, this is what was uh, said to me from the like when we called the league they said um, you don't have a contract. So I had been playing in the league for three months and... Um, How was it you didn't have a contract if you'd been playing for three that's months? That's what I said. So I, uh, I, but when they came back to me, they said, you don't have a contract. You can take what we put in front of you or you can get nothing. And so I had to take what was in front of me and essentially it looked the same seemed the same, like the wording wasn't very different, but when it came out the other end, apparently I was entitled to nothing. Hmm. And uh, Tina, how does this make sense? Uh, well, frankly, we don't think it makes sense. The WHL or, and OHL and QMJHL bylaws all stipulate that okay, players... Okay, hang on, a lot of acronyms here. WHL is the Western Hockey League. The OHL. QMJHL is the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. Yes, OHL, which also Ontario covers Hockey League. Eastern Canada. These three different leagues are all involved in this, is that right? Yes, okay. uh, so those are the three member leagues of the CHL. Of the and, Canadian Hockey League. Yes. <laughs> and the, uh, the bylaws of each of the leagues stipulate that players uh, aren't permitted actually to take the ice for a regular season game without having a valid signed, uh, reviewed by the commissioner standard player agreement. Uh, so obviously we, we have some questions about what yeah. happened with, with Sam's standard player agreement. Um, also, I just wanted to note that in general, um, a lot of these changes to the education package to make it more accessible uh, and to make it more, uh, to, to broaden the scope of, of the packages offered are quite recent. A lot of them uh, in response to significant outcry from, from players and, and fans. Um, because you had you had players who would who would play you know one or two games on a tryout with an ECHL team and that voided their entire scholarship eligibility. Mm -hmm. um, you had players uh, like like Sam where there were irregularities with their contracts and despite putting in the time, hitting the ice on behalf of their teams, they weren't getting their education packages. Okay, you wanted to add Sam. Yeah, and uh, despite all of these regulations, what they have on paper, when we when myself and my father talked to the OHL, so David Branch and his subordinates, we, um, we were told that this was commonplace, that there guys all the time play half a season or even a full season without a contract getting ratified by the league. And I didn't understand that at all because like uh, what Jake said is that the minute we step on the ice for the, the, NC, or for the OHL, we lose our NCAA scholarship, our eligibility. We can't go get a scholarship in the States. So. And that, that is actually part of what they're paying for when they get the players. They're saying, no, no, come here because we can give you all that they can give you and more. Hmm. Um, Jake, let me ask you this. What are the London Knights worth? Uh, I don't know exact dollar figure. It's a, it's a privately owned team, so some of that's cut to the chest. I know there's some other teams in the league that they're on the, their books are a bit more public. But I, in the London Knights, I imagine it's it's one of the uh, richer teams in the OHL. Would the London Knights be worth more than a million bucks? Uh, guessing, I would I would imagine yes. I would be surprised if it was under that. They make a profit. Yes. Do you think, given the financial realities around 
the Knights and other teams in the uh, Ontario Hockey League, do you think that they are doing right by their players? I think it may be very from team to team, depends who's running it and depends who owns it and how much you know extra money they have to to throw around. And it's not paying kids extra money. It's it's you know having those extra amenities that and uh, that uh, goes with having a kid under your control, basically, or you're taking care of these kids as long as they're uh, part of your team from September until whenever your season's over. So you, you get a lot of those extras, and it really varies from team to team. Is a player who plays in the league going to have likely a bit more extras in London than if they play one of the smaller markets? Probably, just because there's a lot more sponsorship dollars involved. I mean, Friday night, there's 9,000 people uh, at Budweiser Gardens in London. No one else has that kind of consistent fan base as far as people coming in the door game in and game out so obviously there's going to be a bit more revenue from that and you're going to make a bit more money just from those sheer numbers themselves should the players be entitled to a larger share of that revenue well then it's going to be differing from 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 team to team and then at that point i kind of think of we know if players are deserve a share of their specific team revenue, then if I'm getting drafted as a 16-year-old, you know what, I'm not going to get drafted to any team whose revenue is below a certain mark because I want to get my cut. So that sort of opens up a bit of a can of worms in my eyes where is a player entitled to the revenue from a specific team or is it revenue from a specific league? It, it's sort of, it. it I mean, my, that's the, kind of my thought on the matter is this, you know, should somebody who's playing for a team who only gets about 1,500 fans on a night-to-night -night basis be getting compensated for the same as somebody who has 9,000, 7,000 on a night-to-night -night basis. That's uh, something that I know I, I have in my mind. Got it. The, um, the Ontario Hockey League actually approached uh, the Ontario government, Doug Ford's government, yep. and said to them, uh, please cut us a break here. We can't pay minimum wage uh, to our Ontario Hockey League players. And this was the response that the OHL got from the government of Ontario as expressed in the economic statement that came out last fall. We'll put an excerpt of it up on the screen here. The Ontario government is committed to protecting amateur hockey in Ontario. To ensure OHL teams have a level playing field, the province will exclude OHL players from the Employment Standards Act 2000 while guaranteeing they receive scholarships for post-secondary education. This change will bring Ontario in line with other provinces helping to ensure the long-term sustainability of the league. Tina, what is your view of that decision made by the Ontario government? Uh, well, that statement came out about three seconds after the open letter from Commissioner David Branch. It was pretty clear to us that, that the decision had been made, you know, before this all transpired. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but our council team actually put out uh, an, an open letter on behalf of, of Sam and Dan, our, our two representative plaintiffs, and, and the rest of the class who we who we represent. How many in that class, incidentally? Uh, well, so the, the the class is different than the number of players who have expressed interest in in the class action. In total, from across Canada, we've had several hundred uh, current and former players express interest in, in learning more about the class action, and so they've registered with us. Uh, the total number of, pe of people in the class is however many players played in the seasons for which the certification order uh, applies. So roughly from the 2012-2013 season to the end of the 2016-2017 season. Okay. How hopeful were you, Sam, that the Ontario government, when it took a look at this, would come to the conclusion that eh, maybe the players deserve a better break or at least making minimum wage. I'm always hopeful that people will see our side and because I think it's the right side. But um, I, I'm very passionate about this issue specifically because recently uh, I found out that something that's very troubling to me is that um, uh, employment standards issues are not constitutional issues. And that's a very big issue, and I'm gonna tell you why right now. It's because, because employment standards issues are not a constitutional issue, they can't be appealed to the highest court. So this law is passed, this law is passed uh, by, um, by the Ontario government saying, you we're going to exempt the players. Um, so what could, ha what could end up happening in this province and in provinces across the country is that we could have the court saying that if we win, we could have the court saying that, yes, these 
OHL players are employees. Mm -hmm. And we could have the, the legislature saying, they're employees, but we're not going to pay them like that. So now I, I pose the question to the audience. Do you work? Do you have a job? I'm sure you do, and I'm sure you work very hard. But if we don't have appeals to the Constitution to stick up for your rights, to stick up for our rights, auto workers, retail workers, anybody, you can have your rights taken away. I, call your representatives at the government level, at the provincial level, at the federal level. Call Justin Trudeau, send letters in. Call anyone, call TV personalities. John Oliver on TV, he does these great deep dives into different things. Call somebody because your rights can be taken away just as quickly as ours were. The, the law that the government passed doesn't say that we're not employees. The, the law that the government passed says we are employees. We're just not going to pay you like that, like employees. So whatever your job is right now, they can say, okay, you're an employee. We're not going to give you the same protections as an employee. Jake, in your view, do the players at least deserve minimum wage? Well, I mean, some of the former players that I had spoke to, they get something it's not, they don't get an hourly wage, but uh, to the players I spoke to last year, I'd say that they get about almost about 50 bucks or 500 bucks a month. So that kind of helps them on top of their housing. And I can't speak for um, Sam's experience in general, but this is what I've heard from a couple of their players. Is it's around that. And then overagers get paid a bit more because they are 20 year olds. So they're, you know, a bit, bit older. So they mean, I think the league feels like they're properly compensated. When you look at everything that's given to them, my concern is if a player is paid minimum wage, their expenses are going to be far more than what they're making from their team from making minimum wage because you look at how expensive sticks are. I know that's the first thing to jump out to with the sticks and equipment, but just that alone is going to cost you. Um, look at a lot of teams throughout, like with a lot of Knights, for example, they have a partnership with the Blythe Academy. Can I jump in here, Jake? Can I jump in yes, here? Yes, please. Yeah, Just, I, I'm sorry. I, I really don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the, all of the teams that I played for and that I was aware of around the OHL, none of them paid for their sticks, none of them paid for their equipment, skates, anything. They were all on very big and lucrative um, sponsorships with these teams or with these uh, brands. So they send them gear and it's to the point where you're not allowed to wear other equipment. So it's not like so all you of got your you got your sticks and equipment for free. But the teams didn't have to pay the for them because of endorsement deals. And I didn't get them. I had to give them back when I was sent when away from the team. Huh. Yeah. So yeah, that is... Oh, sorry. I, I just want to clarify. So our position is that none of this matters. Uh, when you do work, when you are an employee, you're entitled to basic protections uh, according to the law, uh, although perhaps not according to the Ford government. Um, and uh, there are benefits to certain jobs. When I travel for my job, I don't have to pay for my own hotel room. I don't have to pay for my own flights. Uh, that is a benefit of my job. And I'm, I'm going to, let's say, Calgary for a WHL hearing because it, it's part of my job duties. And they tell players don't pay for their sticks or skates or mm -hmm. jerseys. Um, and and that's it's it's a benefit of their job. It doesn't mean they also don't deserve to get paid for the labor that they provide. I get you, but let, let's acknowledge here that the Ontario Hockey League is not dealing with the kind of dollars that, for example, the National Hockey League deals with. This we is... don't know that though. The, well, the OHL doesn't release their books, and we've gotten the allegedly, I'm going to say, the OHL, the CHL as a whole, has boasted that they have more ticket sales than the NBA, the NHL, and the MLB com combined. In Canada. Well, in Canada. Because they got more teams. They've got 60 teams, so yeah. they don't have... They got twice as many teams in the CHL as the NHL. So that's part of it. But, it, I mean, I'm only getting around to the issue that if, let's say your side wins after this gets through the whole legal process, do you have a dollar figure in mind of what this would ultimately cost the OHL teams to fulfill? Well, it's pretty simple math. There's, I think, typically anywhere, uh, I mean, if you're healthy for the whole season, you have, what, 24 players. Um, and assuming you have some call-ups and, and injuries, you're up to 30, like mid-low 30s. Um, 
multiplied by the minimum wage, which is not that high uh, in most places. Fourteen across. bucks an hour, I guess, in Ontario. Yeah, right and, now. and it's it's stuck there, and it's um, lower than that in most provinces, I think. So I think the math that we came up with is that it would cost under four hundred thousand dollars a year per team to pay the players minimum wage, and okay. and so I just wanted to mention also that some of the teams um, produced their. Uh, a certain subsection of their financial records uh, as part of the litigation they were ordered to by the courts. Um, and our forensic accountant reviewed those financial records and concluded that there's not really enough evidence in there to sustain what the teams are saying about the fact that you know they might have to go under or they might have to not have enough sticks for their players. Um, well, and- let me put that to Jake. Jake, if, if, if every... OHL team were required to come up with another $400,000 in order to fulfill what could be the legal outcome of this case, what would that do to the team's financial health as far as you know? Well, I mean, the upper teams, I think, are going to be fine. And I can't speak to each team's books because, uh, as um, both these people have mentioned, is is their no, they're, they're hidden. They're, their books are kept to themselves. But I imagine there is a handful of teams in all three of those leagues that would just cease to exist. Um, they wouldn't be able to because they barely can make it. But yeah, they make a little bit of money, but not enough for the $400,000 or however much extra it would be a year uh, on top of that. And then I, I can see there being a handful of teams that would have to fold. And then the rest, their money would be a whole lot tighter initially. But I'm not a, a financial or, or a legal expert on that. Have you got a a sense, if we're talking 60 teams across uh, Canada, Mm -hmm. have you got a sense about what percentage of the teams would have no sweat coming up with the money, what would be able to handle it moderately, and Mm -hmm. which ones would go under? Yeah, with the other two leagues, I'm not uh, as well-versed in um, which teams are kind of doing better financially. And sometimes it changes year to year. A team goes on a, a good run a couple of years, and they're able to you know, make a few more bucks during, on those playoff runs. But I imagine looking at the OHL, I can see there may be being four or five teams that may be uh, a bit high. But there could be you know, anywhere between three and five teams who would have a tough time in my eye. Would you, Sam, worry about... Uh, I mean, that's if five teams were to disappear, that's 100 places basically for potential hockey players. I am very, very concerned at all times about the players. That's what we're doing this for. However, I would say that, as Jake has said, there are other options for these players, but not only that, we look at these, we look at these teams and we, we say, well, they're gonna go under if, we, if they have to pay the players. So my question is this, do we allow these teams to flout employment standards just because they're not going to make money and they're not going to be able to support themselves so they don't they don't have to pay their players just just no i take your point but yeah. you know the, they're the ontario hockey league does play in some cities and towns in the province of ontario where that's the only that's the only team right Absolutely. that's it and if they were to lose that only team because they couldn't come up with the four hundred thousand dollars to pay the players what you believe to be Absolutely. a legitimate expense. What I'm would saying, you feel bad about that? I would feel bad that I f- would feel bad about anything. I'm kind of a worry wart that way, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like I want everybody to be happy, but at the same time, is it worth taking advantage of players for their passions? They they work so teenagers. Yeah, they teenagers. are teenagers. Yep. Are we okay as a society saying? You don't have rights just so this guy can make money. Well, let me follow up with this, Sam. You know, uh, in preparation for this, uh, our producer, Sandra Jonas, talked to uh, some former OHL players about their years in the league. And one thing that uh, she was told that stood out is that, yes, you are very young when you come to play in the OHL, but you are billeted with a family, so you are kind of, you're, you're cared for, right? I mean, these are families that care for their, the coaches and the teams look out for you as well. Um, they, a lot of these players were saying things like, there's a great safety net underneath you to make you feel that you were well supervised and didn't fall through the cracks. Was that your experience when you played? It was not my experience. And um, I'm curious how many times people like Daniel Carcillo have to come out and say, we were beaten, we were sexually assaulted, we were abused, until we say, hey, maybe there is a systemic problem here. Maybe the players aren't respected to the level that they need to be. This is the, the typical hazing that goes on typical. on a, a lot of it's teams. It's not that, rare. And yeah. I'm sick and tired of these teams telling people, this doesn't happen. No, no, no. 
No, this is a systemic problem as much as anything else. These teams don't pay the players, and there's a systemic problem. There is no safety net there. These players go through crazy, crazy amounts of things while they're developing. When is enough enough? And, and Sam, do you feel like as if these uh, athletes were getting paid that they would have more of an opportunity to, you know, to fight against something like this if, if an issue like this does happen? My issue is that as, as an employee, you have more rights, you, you, have, the, you have more protections. There, you're, able, you're better able to protect yourself, but that is not the issue. The issue is getting respect for the players, and we're doing that by trying to get minimum wage for the players and the protections that come with that. It sounds like, I got, I got to, forgive me guys, I got to jump in here, but it, it sounds like we have two different issues here. One being the, yes. the cultural issues around hockey, which uh, are indefensible yeah. under any circumstances. And then this more complicated issue of um, compensating players for what you believe are, are yeah. your just desserts well, and I, so on. Sorry, I, if I can yes, just jump Tina, in. Yes, Tina, go ahead. Um, we think that there are two different issues. The league has tried to conflate those two issues. If you think back about the statement that you read out loud, they advert to the wonderful relationship that, that they have with the players, the way that they take care of them, et cetera. Um, and uh, Jake echoed some of those talking points that we've heard from the league throughout their materials. In the legal case, they focus on what they refer to as an in loco parentis relationship, where they are caregivers for mm -hmm. the players. Uh, and, and our argument is that, again, that's relevant to uh, the employment relationship. Really, uh, really, what it is is that we're we're attacking the symptom. So the the real problem is the lack of respect. We're attacking the symptom that we're not getting paid. There are other people who are attacking the symptom that players are being abused. I want to thank all three of you for coming on to TVO tonight for a very tough conversation about a very tricky issue. Uh, Jake Jeffries, thank you for being there for us in London. Tina Yang, Samberg, here in our Toronto studio. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.